Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, I am going ferreting on lovely downland in merry old England. I'm meeting a man who reckons he's got the biggest partridges in Britain. First, it's our own creature of the night. It's Roy Lupton and he's out foxing. As you can probably tell, Roy is a giver and not a receiver. For Roy, it's charity, not chastity. He performs acts of kindness wherever he goes and never says, no thank you, that will be a bit uncomfortable. In this case, it's Hampshire and a shoot where he had fantastic sport last season. To repay the generosity of the shoot owner, Roy has offered to do some high-tech foxing to get on top of some of the trickiest customers in the country. We are going to be completely covert tonight and we're using every single bit of night vision kit and uh, technology that we've got in the hope that we can uh, catch up with a few of them. We know there's three, at least three foxes on here that as soon as the lamp touches them they're away. So with uh, a little bit of mouth calling, a little bit of electronic calling and with the use of all the night vision we'll, uh, fingers crossed, be able to get on top of them. The pheasants and the partridges are being hit hard and the keepers are having trouble contending with educated animals. And there's only one way to deal with that. Night vision plus a splash of thermal imaging too. It doesn't take long to find our first couple of foxes. 30 seconds actually, just across the road from the yard. But they ain't shifting, regardless of the calling by Darren and Roy. Before we need to make the decision on which one to take, there's movement to our left. This one isn't stopping. You can see the beam of the Nightmaster Illuminator that sits on top of Darren's rifle moving to pick up the fox. Usually Roy is the one looking down the optics, but tonight he is one of the three blind mice, while it's Darren who is cat's eyes Cunningham. Well that one worked absolutely superbly, not uh, quite as we um, thought it would pan out, but it's, it's odd for me being on the other side because normally I'm up on the rifle. It's, uh, it's actually quite nice just squeaking and driving around. It's nice not having the pressure of shooting as well. All right. There we go. Very, very nice sized dog fox. So put him in and I'm sure that won't be the last one for tonight. First impressions would suggest a plague of foxes making this shoot their home. Envy gives us a definite advantage, so does thermal imaging and we have both tonight. Our next fox comes from way off. Darren knows there is a job to be done here and we're not going to risk losing this one for the sake of the camera. shoots as it sits out at 230 yards. Let's have a look at that one. That's another good fox. You're breeding them big down this way, aren't you? <laughs> They're feeding well in your pheasants, aren't they? <laughs> Gee whiz, that is another decent sized dog, isn't he? Beautiful fox, absolutely beautiful. And Darren pulled off a really nice shot on that. So uh, you can hear the, the bullet going. So uh, there was a good, uh, a good pause between strike and when the bullet left. But again, just another very, very nice large dog fox. So uh, they're certainly being bred uh, big down this way. And as I just said to the estate owner, I think he's uh, been feeding them far too well on his pheasants and partridges, but it didn't go down too well. Roy mixes up the calls, changing between mouth squeaks and the Western River electronic call. We pick up eyes way in the distance, but no matter what we have to offer, they're a nervy lot. Just setting up the call out here now. And uh, what we've got is we've got the, the one that I downloaded, which is a cleaned out Vixen call, which I'm hoping might work tonight because I've heard 
a few foxes already start to mate. So um, we're only in November, but they're already starting to kick up. We set up in what could normally be dead search situations, but we're starting to work hard for our Charlies. We end up back where we started, and there's a set of eyes along the bottom hedge. Darren doesn't mess about. It's hard hit, but we can't find it. Well, a lovely whiff of it just then. Not all our kit is cutting edge. If we struggle, Roy is going to try squeaking using this high-tech device. Maybe we'll save it for another day. It is now about midnight and nothing is responding. We spend a good ten minutes trying to play this fox, but it's fruitless, or so we think. We swing around and bump into this chap coming towards us. You need eyes in the back of your head in this job. Maybe we ought to get Darren working on a fox early warning radar system, or at least eating more carrots. Another dog? Huh? Oh dear. <laughs> And another one. So uh, at least we've got that one a bit closer for you, eh? <laughs> we struggle on for another couple of hours and we see nothing. It is one of the first cold November nights, so maybe they've gone to ground. However, considering the odds were against us, we did okay. Well Darren, bright eyed and bushy tailed, Roy, flying blind, and between them employing the kind of technology you need for tricky foxes, including the rubber chicken. <laughs> Night. Night, night. Roy Lapton out there on a very dark night. And now for our own dark night, it's David on the Field Sports Channel New Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The RSPCA has dropped yet another case against a pack of foxhounds. The animal rights charity wanted to use covert surveillance from the League Against Cruel Sports to prove that Ledbury huntsman Will Goff had been hunting a fox. This is the fourth failed RSPCA hunt prosecution this year. The Countryside Alliance calls the RSPCA's latest case harassment dressed up as legal process. If ever there was an argument against taking headshots, it's this deer from the USA. Although the arrow was causing the animal no great distress, it serves as a reminder how easy it is to miss with a headshot. Instead of shooting the animal, local wildlife officials tranquilised it, removed the arrow and released it straight back into the middle of the deer hunting season. Not his day. The indefatigable Eddie Nash from the Lamping Foxes Facebook page has a new call. Search Facebook for Lamping Foxes to find out about the Nasher Fox Call. Recently we showed you the 3D printer and how you can make a gun from plastic. Now there's 3D printing in metal, which raises both hopes and fears that it won't be long before you'll be able to print yourself a pair of purdies. A company called Solid Concepts has brought out a method of 3D printing by layered powdered metal and setting it with a laser. Now, do you make the best slow gin? To celebrate the famous sticky drink favoured by shooters, the Feathers Hotel in Woodstock, Oxfordshire is holding a competition for the best slow gin in the UK. Entries close on Monday the 18th of November 2013, judging is on the 29th of November and there's an open public day on the 30th of November. Visit feathers.co.uk And finally, a party of fishermen in Alaska spent four hours freeing a 16-foot killer whale which was stranded on rocks. Waiting for the tide to come in, they threw water over the animal to keep it cool and when it began to lose strength and started coughing, they stuck oars under its pectoral fins and pried it into the water. It righted itself, took a deep breath and was off. So no explosives required this week. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, I've been off to see a man who wants to introduce a new game bird to the south of England, and they're a real bustard. Between the middle of the 19th century and the early 21st, the heaviest wild breeding bird in the UK was the mute swan at around 11 kilograms, or not far off two stones. The previous contender was the great bustard, which our forebears hunted to extinction in Britain in the 1840s. In 2004, a retired policeman from Wiltshire hatched a plan, and later an egg, which raised that weight by nearly half. 
Words like sustainability and conservation are now part of the language of shooting. David Waters and his team are trying to right the wrongs of the past by bringing back this bastard. They are going to extraordinary lengths, getting eggs from Russia to start with, plus there's the red tape. They are a class one red data book species in Russia. They're like the same legal status as a Siberian tiger. So the, it's literally a box full of licenses to get the birds out of Russia. And similarly, a fair old bit of paperwork and bureaucracy on the UK side to be able to release them. So I think it was about six years after I started the project that we actually released the first birds. David became interested in the great bustard as a boy, maybe because you can say bustard with gusto and get away with it. Since then, he has also become fascinated with muskets, but that's another story. He's made it his mission to succeed where others have failed. His reintroduction programme is dependent on the Russian farmers. We're only allowed to collect eggs from nests which have been destroyed by agriculture. And if it's a very dry season, they can actually get on and cultivate most of the fields before the bustards have laid. So it's, it's a good year for the Russian great bustards, but it's a bad year for the UK project. Um, I think the highest number I've ever had in a year has been 32, but we've had several years where it's been just six birds. Foxes are a problem for younger birds, but David says that as they mature, bustards can outmaneuver foxes. This young one is especially feisty. But each bustard is a precious commodity and needs protecting, especially as the males don't become fertile until they are five years old. Unlike sort of most of the game birds, great bustards are long-lived birds. A male will live for 20 years plus, a female somewhere in the mid-teens. And they are pretty much predator-proof. So an unsuccessful couple of years can actually be catastrophic for grey partridge. But for great bustards, you're looking over the next 10, 12 or 15 years. So uh, you know, we, we can afford a bit of time to watch the population grow. Thanks to dedication, 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 David is hoping to achieve a sustainable population of bustards in the next few years. But I doubt they'll make it back onto the quarry list in his lifetime. If you want to find out more, go to greatbustard.org. From big birds to a bright, beautiful day in November in merry old England on Downland. Let's go underground and go ferreting. Jaff calls it Rabbitopia, and that's why we're here. Mark Jaff Jafferson is a leading light in the South Somerset Ferreters, a group of families and friends who get together at weekends not to do anything dull like play football or go shopping, but to go ferreting so he is always on the lookout for the new Watership Down. And there is no doubt, as we set out the nets, this place looks perfect. Nets are in a bit of a mess here. Yeah, I don't know who uh, packed them up last time, but... Well, I do, but I can't mention any names on camera, really. <laughs> Paul yeah. Jefferson. Paul Jefferson, my brother. I'll blame him because he's not here. What's the plan? Catch as many rabbits as we can, really, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we always like to try and do a good job for the farmer. But these rabbits, they're pretty clever. Been here for 2,000 years, aren't they? <laughs> so. You know you're, you're about to be outsmarted by a rodent, you know that? Yeah, yeah I blame the Romans for bringing them over here. But yeah, I mean, when we pulled up this morning, there's rabbits everywhere, plenty of action. So hopefully, if we don't get a bag of 50 today, I'll be quite surprised. Hopefully, fingers crossed, you know. Uh, the long nets, the gate nets and the purse nets out, it's now a question of standing around to wait. And wait. And wait. The first action is not what we want. One ferret comes out of the berry looking like it's been in a nasty fight. Whether he's come across a stoat or... Yeah. I don't know, I'll put him back in the box, I think. Yeah. One antiseptic spray later and the ferret is retired from the action today and put in a nice warm box in a vehicle. Back to the western front and it's still all quiet. Then a rabbit comes out. <laughs> Jaff is a bit depressed. Today has not gone according to plan. However, we have seen some rabbits lolloping about next to an unpromising looking bramble bush a bit further down the valley. Well, he called it a rabbitopia and he said 50 rabbits. Not quite 50 rabbits, which is why we've moved here. We set up the nets again. Today is about nets and dogs. The dogs you want to be fast and vicious killers. Well, you want the nets to be fast and vicious catchers, so Jaff chooses them carefully. Well, these are the, the purse nets we use. I got these from Bridport Nets down in Bridport. Yeah, I've been there for a long, long time. All the fishing nets and 
think they've supplied the fishing industry for, for a long, long time. These are a, a 10Z three foot net. Basically brilliant. I mean, I don't like hemp nets myself because hemp will rot away. These you can pack away damp. As long as you don't leave them in, all summer damp in a bag, they'll be fine. But certainly from week to week, they'll last forever. They, they won't rot. Hemp rots. These won't, you know. This spot turns out to be much better. Maybe that's the problem with ferreting. You have a system of berries as big as the London Tube Network and the ferrets just run round in circles underground chasing rabbits. You need a shallow berry to get the rabbits out into the fresh air and into the jaws of the dogs. Not all the ferrets want to come back to the surface. Even a berry this size has lots of chambers with lots of yummy things in them. The gang use the ferret finders and occasionally locate a ferret that has killed the rabbit underground and is stuck behind it. In the old days you would poke a bramble branch down the hole to see if it came back with fur on. Now you use an endoscope, which gadget man Jaff deploys to discover that, in this case, that's exactly what happens. Rabbit removed and the ferret is free. We end the morning with lunch. Jaff once again rides to the rescue with a jenny, a microwave and some of his venison and pigeon pasties. <laughs> and here we have today's top prize. <laughs> It's possible there is too much oil in the mixture, which suddenly turns our ferreting film into something out of the Highlander. Still, the pasties taste good, if slightly of two stroke. And after lunch, there is one more burst of action. So, a dozen rabbits by the end of the day, a lost ferret, which Jaff retrieves the following morning by leaving out a box and a dead rabbit, and the injured ferret makes a full recovery. If you want to find out more about Jaff and the gang, search Facebook for South Somerset Ferreters. And if you want good nets, go to bridportnets.co.uk. And now, the map that matters. It's calendar. Welcome to this week's calendar in association with Basque, with dates for your diary, smartphone, tablet and filofax. It's the Woodcock Moon this Sunday, 17th of November 2013. The second full moon in November is traditionally the date of the big wave of Woodcock coming over from Europe to the UK. And everything is looking good for that migration. Temperatures are dropping and ice is spreading west across from the map from Russia. Meanwhile, the UK has settled into its annual position of being in the brunt of the prevailing southwesterly winds, which are carrying band after band of rain with them. If the temperature drops enough, this could turn to snow. The woodcocks stay ahead of the ice, but have to fly into the winds in search of soft mud where they can probe for worms. On the sporting front, the rest of the game bird seasons are at their height, and the hind and doe culls are underway. Now turning to rural events, and Basque's website lists the following. If you're interested in deer, there's a stalker's evening on Thursday the 14th of November 2013, near Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. There are two ladies shoot days this Saturday, 16th of November. Basque is holding a lady members driven game day at Catton Park, South Derbyshire. And the Shotgun and Chelsea Bun Club is clay shooting at Nottingham District Gun Club in Nottinghamshire. The rest of the events are about eating game. On Thursday the 14th and on Friday the 15th, there are dining room game nights in Ashbourne, Derbyshire. Also on the 15th and also in Derbyshire, there's a taste of game dinner evening at the Butler's Pantry in Michelover. On Saturday night, there's a game gourmet evening at the Pheasant Restaurant in County Down, Northern Ireland. And next Wednesday, 20th of November, Kent Cookery School is holding a venison demo and dine evening. For more information, please go to the Basque website and click on the events tab. Now to the wider world of hunting, shooting and fishing on YouTube. It is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. Let's start with birds. Grouse Revenge is a short film designed to promote GoPro cameras. Nice to see a big company embracing shooting sports. The protagonists here are shooting grouse and shooting with cameras on a moor in North Yorkshire in the UK. And the final frame has a grouse cracking the rib of a shooter. Jacob Hunt is spreading the word on the Facebook groups about his new channel, Cabin Outdoors. This film is Illinois Goose Hunting 2013 Beanfield, an evening goose flight in Northern Illinois, USA. Go and see what you think. The Norwegian hunter is not 
someone who hunts Norwegians, but someone who enjoys a variety of other unusual shooting sports. Here's one he sent me that you don't see in many countries. He is after seabirds from a boat with a 12 bore shotgun. Jensen fly fishing wears out boot rubber, looking for the best scenery in which to fish. This film is all a bit dreamy and all about the American yearning for what they call a spring, a creek, and what we call a mountain stream or burn. The schmaltz aside, it's a lovely film about stalking trout. From light tackle for pretty little fish to carp fishing at thorny water a day ticket £30. Chris Westley reviews a British day ticket carp fishery that's got more weed bed scravel bars and sunken barges than my daughter's goldfish aquarium. Our viewer Gun Nut recommends the O'Neill Ops Pro Staff channel, which is heavy on the tactical. I have picked Predator Hunting Suppressed TM Lost in Translation, where Mr O'Neill Ops is calling in and taking superb long-range shots on kayaks in South Dakota while living out a slightly dodgy military sniper fantasy. Now to save a red squirrel in the UK, you shoot a grey. Here's Air Gun Red Squirrel Hunt 2, which palpitating British shooters will be pleased to hear takes place in the USA. And it's Tamiya Skiris Hudsonicus, a different species to our Skiris vulgaris. Thank you, Mr Attenborough. Finally, here's a wonderful public information film. Bear Spray Demonstration for Hunters is by the big game superstar Craig Boddington. He gives a one minute demonstration on how to carry and use bear spray while hunting in a film produced, of course, by the interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. I hope I get gigs like that when I am older. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link, charlie, at fieldsportschannel.tv. Now we have a couple of plugs for our own films this week. The first is a new series on Saturday nights from the USA. Headhunter Chronicles with Jason Bruce has been on US Network TV and now it's on Field Sports Channel. Jason is calling and hunting an enormous bull elk in California with the bow during the elk rut. But first he has to get past the rest of the herd to take the shot and then there are the pig. Jason can't resist wild pig. Click on the link on the screen to watch it. In this week's Schools Challenge TV, we visit the home of British shooting at Bisley in Surrey. It hosts events and competitions throughout the year and is headquarters for shooting organisations including the British NRA and the CPSA. Again, click the link to watch our film. Well, we are back next week when I will be in Yorkshire and the Caribbean. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere around the outside of the screen. Or go to our webpage, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, or scroll down to the bottom over on the right, you'll see the constant contact page where you'll be able to pop your email address in and we will constantly contact you about our programme that's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain.